So uh, we'll begin the meeting. Uh, in this panel meeting, uh, I talk about a powerful partnership. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, my first time in India, so it's, uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, if you wonder why I look a bit, uh, sort of, I have a red face, it's because uh, this stupid white uh, Western tourist uh, went biking yesterday but forgot to put on sunscreen. So the good part is that uh, I contacted the university. They said, okay, we'll, we'll let you keep your PhD for now. So I can still give my talk today, uh, which will be on uh, basically on geometry in complex networks. Uh, it's a talk based on several papers. This is together with all of the authors that are here. You don't have to memorize their names. I will come back to them near the end of the presentation. And uh, so I have a program that I, that I intend to go through, but if at any point uh, you have a question, something is unclear, please, please stop me and ask me a question because uh, I, I'm always very happy to go into discussion, even if that means that I can't finish what I want, what I have on the slides. All right. So in general, uh, we're all here because we work on networks and uh, especially for instance me, but many people also work on networks because we uh, and random graphs because we want to study complex systems or complex networks. And so there are of course many different types of complex networks out there. There are technological networks like the internet, there are lots of social networks, even lots of biological networks like the brains or cell-cell interaction networks. And of course, many, many more types of complex systems that we can model as networks. And in general, how I view this is that the, the goal of studying these, uh, these, these uh, networks is because we want to basically understand, predict, but also potentially control the complex systems that they represent, right? So we try to, we try to understand these systems, we want to predict certain processes on them and ideally control their outcomes. And the way that uh, we, uh, that for instance, I approach this in my research, but many others also do, probably many of you here, is that we, uh, we use random graph models to build networks that are similar to the networks that we are interested in, and then try to use the, the math behind the random models to be able to say something on one of these topics related to the actual system. And so we use random graphs as models for complex networks, trying to understand, predict, or control them. And today I want to talk about uh, sort of studying complex networks and building random graph models. And the key star uh, of today is going to be geometry. So, I like geometry a lot. Uh, uh, I'm not the only one. So geometry is also a very important fundamental uh, ingredient in many uh, physical theories, right? Many, uh, many, many physics relies on some form of geometry. Uh, in particular, this is uh, one of the projects later on is basically comes from, from this type of field, right? In, in the field of understanding quantum, quantum gravity, uh, geometry is a very important tool. And even there are even people that are using random graphs to work on a theory of uh, quantum gravity. But of course, geometry also lives outside of the realm of math and physics. So for example, it was already used for a very long time in sociology and psychology, where basically researchers use geometry as a certain latent space to basically group people together that say have similar interests or similar hobbies. So geometry has been around for a very long time, also outside math and physics. And, uh, and I, I usually like to use geometry in networks. So what I mean with that is that usually there is some geometric space, whatever it is, and then we want to use the geometry of this space to build models, random graph models that can mimic properties of the networks that we're interested in. And in part one of this talk, I'm going to give you some flavor or some examples of how we can use geometry to build better complex, better random graph models for complex networks. Now, basically, what that means is that in part one, I start, I use geometry and then get a network out of it. So I have an arrow from left to right. Now I can, of course, also draw an arrow from right to left. And then I have to explain what I mean with this. But so what I'm going to do in part two is I'm going to try and go the other way around. So if somebody gave me a network that was constructed using some geometry, I can ask the question, well, can I extract information of this geometry from the discrete structure of the network? It turns out, in certain cases, you can, and this is what I'm going to talk to in part two. So this is the plan for today. So with that, I will go to the first part. So modeling complex networks using geometry. So 
before I want to start, I want to sort of sort of set the stage here because when I say modern complex networks, I mean lots of different things. But how I approach this is always as follows. So usually you are given some complex system that you can model as a network, and you're interested in studying this system. And usually the system has a certain set of properties that are very important, right? So they are either given, but usually given by domain experts. So these properties of this system or the network, those are very important. And then what many people then try to do is we're trying to build a random graph model that has sort of similar properties. But usually what we want is that as the size of our network grows to infinity, right, then the, these properties converge to the, to the specific values of these properties in the complex system. Right? So as, our, as we generate larger and larger uh, networks, they, uh, they return the same kind of uh, properties that the original system has. Now, why do you want to do these asymptotics? That's a, a question you can ask. Well, generally we want to do this because complex networks, are, the networks that we're interested in are often very large. And because they're very large, it actually means that actually asymptotic, uh, asymptotic properties are very good approximations of these properties in very large systems. But actually, more importantly, I would say is because, well, usually limits are slightly easier to study. So if you ask, for instance, theoretical physicists, particular particle physicists, they will tell you they will tell you there are two easy things, very small systems and infinitely large systems. And everything in between is terrible. So th this is why I personally like to study asymptotic properties, because studying asymptotics is usually slightly easier than studying sort of large but finite sized systems. And finally, a nice thing about when you study these asymptotics, right, is you take, uh, take some limits. So you sort of also had these limits are usually robust in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, the, of course, there's no size anymore. So there's some robustness there. But mainly the reason why you want to use sort of these asymptotic analysis is because the actual networks are very large. So you can actually approximate it very well with asymptotics and studying limits is usually easier. But then, then basically that brings us to the main question, okay, so which properties do we want to have in our models? And of course, for any given very specific system, there are a long list of potential properties that you might want, usually dictated by domain experts. But there are also some properties that we see reoccurring in many complex systems. So ideally, we would also like to build random graph models that at least can mimic those properties. And I will give you sort of two or three of those to, uh, today. So the first has to do with degrees in networks. So basically the first property that, uh, that we want to mimic is that many of the complex systems or the networks that we're studying, they are sparse. And in this case, what I mean by sparse, I mean that the empirical average degree in the network, so this is just the degree, so this is the average degree in the network, this converges to some uh, positive number as n goes to infinity. I did not exactly specify what mode of convergence I'm taking, uh, but usually, right, because we're talking about random graphs, you can think of this as convergence in probability. Are you worried about the graph being simple? Or, or? Uh, I'm not, at this point, not worried about the graph being simple, actually, but the models that I'm going to talk about, they will generate simple graphs. But I'm, I'm not posing this as a, as, a, as a property here, but they will be simple. So second to being sparse, we often observe something about the degree distribution and uh, uh, have a very sort of popular way to, to say this is say, oh, there are power law degrees, uh, but I'm going to be a bit more uh, explicit. So if we look at the empirical degree distribution, it's just a fraction of nodes of, uh, who have degree K. If you plot this on a log-log scale, then for many networks, you see pictures that look like this. And now if you squint your eyes a bit, uh, sort of you, then you can, somehow draw some straight lines uh, over these, uh, over these uh, distributions. And basically what this means, right, is if you ask people in, uh, in network science what this means, they say, oh, this means that this function decays as some inverse power of the degree k. Uh, and this was observed already a long time ago in the 1920s uh, when Lotka was studying, uh, uh, this was one of the first studies of uh, citation networks, he observed this. It was later picked up again by Price, who also studied citation networks. But then it basically this concept of power law degrees took off in the 1990s when network science also started to bloom and people were finding power laws everywhere. Now, I can give a whole presentation of what it means for degrees to be power laws and why and how you estimate them or, hey, or does it make sense at all to do this. But for now, I'm just going to sort of formulate what it is that I, how, what, what sort of the translation is that I'm making. 
So what I'm doing is instead of looking at the, uh, the probability mass function, I'm going to look at the tail distribution. So this is the fraction of nodes whose degree is strictly bigger than k. And what I want to have here is that this function converges to a regularly varying function. Now, regularly varying just means that indeed there's this, uh, this inverse, it decays as an inverse power of k, and then there's a slowly varying function, which can be a constant, something converging to a constant, logarithms, powers of logarithms. It's basically to take care of, uh, for example, these kinds of behaviors where you first sort of have this slight decline and then it becomes straight. So this is the property I want for my degree. So I want the tail distribution to converge to a regular varying distribution. Now, and the, the second property that we often see has to do with triangles and communities. So many of the complex systems that we, that we study, they, uh, they have, well, what people would say, they have some communities or they have usually some sort of group structure within the network. So basically what it means is that networks sort of look typically like this very stupid little toy example. Uh, and in particular, what we often see is that these networks have many triangles. There are many triangles present in these networks. And so we want to also have this in our, in our random graph models. So in order for that, there are several ways to characterize the number of triangles in the network. So one way is by what is called the local clustering coefficient. So what you do is you take here delta i is just the number of triangles that node i participates in. You normalize it by the maximal number of triangles the node can participate in, in a simple graph. So that's just the degree choose two. So this is a, a, a clustering coefficient for each node, and you just take the average over all nodes in the graph. Now, in addition to that, there's, a, and then what we want for this, of course, we want that this thing, like the average degree, for example, it converges to some positive number. Now, there's also another way to characterize the clustering, which is a more fine-grained version of this local clustering coefficient. And it's often, uh, I call it the local clustering function. It also goes by the name of the degree-dependent local clustering coefficient. So it's basically the same as this, but now I'm only considering uh, nodes of degree k. So for every k, I'm only looking at the nodes that have degree k. And I then I again look at this clustering coefficient of the nodes. And then, of course, it means that I have to normalize not by n, but by the total number of nodes that have degree k. And that is this n of k. If I want to be very uh, precise, right, I have to include an indicator here that says that there, there is at least one node with degree k, of course, right? And then I have to put this at zero if it's not. But for presentation purposes, I just put this formula like this. So this is a function for every k. And what we usually want, what we then want, of course, is that this function converges to some given limit function. And now, actually, when you study real complex networks, there are actually many cases where this limit function also has some kind of sort of power law behavior. So here is a set of plots that uh, I borrowed from a paper by uh, Clara Steghuis and co-authors who, who studied basically this local clustering function in real networks. And again, you see that basically there is this sort of, this is again on a log plot, there's this type of power law behavior. So what I'm going to postulate then is similar to the degrees that ideally I want, I want to be able to have this function be regularly varying as well. So just to summarize, right? So basically for now, and I mean, I can add properties to this as well, right? But I, I don't do this because of the time constraints. But for now, the properties that I want to put into my random graph models are sparsity, power law degrees, and clustering, which is summarized by these two properties. So these are the properties that I want to be able to get out of my random graph models. What is the symbol delta I get? This theta, it is? Delta I. Delta I is the number of triangles that the node uh, participates in. So the i, number of triangles, i node is it? Yeah, a node i uh, participates in, yes. Uh, all the nodes in the triangle have k degree here, uh, last one? Uh, sorry, what is the? In this, uh, all the nodes in a triangle that you're counting have k degree here. Uh, yeah, the, the ones here, right, indeed. So here, here I'm summing over all nodes, but I'm only looking, only looking at those nodes of degree k. And then for each of those nodes, I'm looking at how many triangles does it have and then normalize it by the maximal number of triangles. In a triangle with other nodes, which don't have degree k. But no, no, yeah, exactly. So it has degree k, but the other nodes in the triangle can have... And actually, there are many studies. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Clara, to also together with Remco, they studied sort of how these... Uh, how, how, what actually, what is the typical degree of nodes in a triangle if you know the degree of the, the, say, the root node of the triangle? All right, so these are the properties that I want to be able to get. So then the question is, okay, how do I construct a model that satisfies all of these properties? 
I mean, everybody that has studied uh, random graphs for some time knows that there is like, there's a whole zoo of models, right? So, okay. So let's, uh, let's see. So here I want to touch upon sort of, I want to start with a very general and also widely known model. It's called inhomogeneous random graphs. So just to quickly uh, sort of say what the model is, there, there are basically three parameters, n, which is the number of nodes. There's a positive uh, random variable, often referred to as the weight or the type. And there's a connection function, kappa. And how the model works is you take n nodes. To each node, you assign a weight sampled IID from, uh, from, the, from this W. And then every pair of nodes is connected with a probability that is basically the value of this kappa evaluated at their weights and then normalized by n. And now, of course, if you take kappa to be a constant everywhere, then you just get sparse random random graphs. But I mean, this is a very general model. It's very flexible. And so you can ask, okay, does it satisfy these properties? Well, you can do some computations and you could get that uh, your, uh, your degree distribution uh, converges to some sort of mixed Poisson uh, distribution. And in particular, right, if this, uh, the random variable you get here, which is not exactly W, it also depends on this kappa. If it has a finite mean, then indeed your graphs are sparse and the average degree is just the expected value of this kappa, of this uh, W kappa. So they're sparse. And you can even pick your W depending on kappa, you can pick your W to be regularly varying. And then for a large range of kappas, you can also prove that the uh, till distribution function of your, uh, uh, of your degrees also converges to a regular varying function. So they also have power law degrees. The problem is that the problem comes with clustering. So a very sort of uh, back of the envelope computation yields that if you look at the expected number of triangles in your whole graph, it looks like this, right? So you need to look at uh, three uh, versions of this kappa, right? For all of the pairs uh, of uh, nodes in your triangle, you get an n to the minus three out there, right? Because that was for each of the probabilities. But then of course you have to look at all possible pairs of nodes or triples of nodes, that's n choose three. And so you can already see that if this, uh, this, this integral is finite, then basically this is something of order one. Meaning that as your graphs become bigger and bigger, right? The number of triangles just stays a constant order. Some integrability, I'm, I'm not being very explicit here, but there's some integrability function. Uh, This is the expectation, right? So kappa is, it has to be, it has to be, it has to be, uh, if kappa is not constant, right? There has to be some, uh, there are some integrability uh, properties. Yeah, a constant kappa will, uh, will work, but a constant kappa or a product of uh, the, the weights, for example, or, um, even uh, even if you take uh, if you take uh, say uh, uh, the the minimum to a certain power times the maximum these types of things. So, but basically the the, the gist here is, and you can make this uh, computation very explicit and also look at all of these other properties. The conclusion is that there's no clustering in these uh, in these graphs. Basically, all of these graphs that's also very nice. All of these graphs are basically sort of locally tree-like, they can be approximated by branching processes, not necessarily Galton-Watson processes, by branching processes. So there are no triangles. Can one argue that this way of modeling kappa is capturing something realistic in the real world? Uh, it's modeling through, through kappa. Uh, is that what people think when they have this connection? No, you can think of it, right? So you can, for example, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now sort of trying to pretend to be like a sociologist, right? So you can think of sort of the weight as representing in some way sort of the uh, uh, sort of the, the, say, the type of person you are, maybe, or the type of hobbies that you have. And then you can say, well, if I have two people, and if, for example, uh, uh, ha depending on their hobbies, right, they might have some, some, uh, some sort of strength or some, uh, ha uh, some sort of type of affiliation strength that will make them sort of become friends. And maybe my function kappa can capture how this depends on their, their hobbies or their interests, right? But again, right, I'm pretending to be sociologist. I'm not, right? No, but there are arguments why, why, why a model like this might, might be realistic. But the problem is you don't get clustering, which, I mean, in social networks, you do. Okay, so that's a problem. So then, come, then comes in the first, for the first time that we see geometry here. So the second model I want to talk about is just random geometric graphs, right? So that's very standard. You take a number of nodes. You have a position space, usually d-dimensional Euclidean space. You can be more fancy if you want. And a connection radius r. 
What you do is you take a torus of volume n, you throw n points uniformly at random in the torus, and you connect to points if they are within distance r. That gives you a, that gives you a graph. You can already see where this is going. Uh, so indeed, because of the triangle inequality, right, if two nodes are connected, it means they're, they're close by. So if I have a node that has two other nodes connected to it, those are close to this node. And then by the triangle inequality, they're also reasonably close together. So there's a larger probability of them also being connected. So in particular, I mean, you can do the computations. These things have clustering. They're clustered, right? They're triangles. Um, they're also sparse. Uh, the average uh, the degree distribution basically converges again to a mixed Poisson. But now this is just uh, the volume of the d-dimensional ball of radius r. But that also immediately gives the problem because this thing, uh, you can never, you cannot tune this, this distribution. Uh, so you don't, th this is just always going to be a Poisson type of distribution. You don't get powerless. Position space, if you take r, d, or torus, doesn't matter. Uh, for the finite for the finite set, you take uh, you take uh, the the torus, and then for say for the infinite setting, you can take R D. You have to take a Poisson point process. I will actually come back to that also at a later stage. So basically, the summary is that okay, we have this nice general set of models that gives us sparse graphs that have power law degrees. We have a model with geometry that is sparse and clustered, but no power law degrees. There are many other models are out there, but usually you get get a flavor like this. And then the question is well. Can't we get the best of both worlds, right? Because we want to basically to have all of these three properties. And the answer to this is yes. And I mean, you might already see uh, what, what, uh, how to do this, uh, but this is uh, in a set of models that we, uh, together with uh, Nila Maitra and, uh, and Remco, who are also sitting here, this is what we call spatial and homogeneous random graphs. Um, and basically the model goes as follows. So uh, we have, these set of parameters, there are n number of nodes. There's a position space, again, r to the d could be fancier metric spaces. There's a positive weight random variable, and there's a connection function. What are we going to do? Well, take a torus of volume n, throw n points uniformly at random in them, like the random geometric graph. But now, like the inhomogeneous random graph, we're going to give each node an IID sampled weight from this, random, from this distribution. And then for any two pair of nodes, we're going to connect them with a probability it is now basically something like this. So it's a probability that depends phi the function kappa on their distance in the torus and their weights. So we're just combining geometry and the, and the weight preferences. And again, right, again, there, there are conditions on kappa, right? I'm not going to be very explicit, but there are some, some sort of mild conditions on kappa that you need in terms of integrability or how sort of the, the how basically if you integrate out the w's, how this function depends on the first parameter, these types of things. Now, and the nice thing is that actually this family of models actually incorporates many known models that many models that were already known. They, for instance, include uh, hyperbolic random graphs. Uh, they include uh, what are called uh, geometric inhomogeneous random graphs, which are almost like this, but slightly less general. Uh, they also include a random connection model with weights, continuous uh, scale field percolation. All of these types of models can be captured in this family. And in particular, right, that also means that at least Within this family, there are models, there are choices to be made such that we get all three properties. But we can actually be more explicit about this. We can actually, actually, we can actually also actually prove sort of very broadly that uh, we get all of these three properties. And the reason we can do that is because these models have something that is even nicer than those three properties. They have local weak limits. Meaning that we can sort of, we have a notion of convergence of these graphs and we can explicitly describe their limits. Yeah, basically, you, you basically uh, you couple the hyperbolic graph uh, uh, to a one-dimensional uh, geometric and homogeneous random graph. So instead of looking at, uh, say, the, uh, the hyperbolic plane, right, uh, with, uh, with positions with, uh, that are sort of alpha uniformly <laughs> distributed, you, uh, you look at uh, sort of a, a circle uh, where you put points on the circle and then you give it weights. And there's a, there's sort of, there's a transformation between these two models, which is not exact, but it's exact up to a reasonable... Uh, up to some scale, and that works. Uh, this is basically how, it, how, how you see this here. For more details, you can look into the paper we have. Uh. Oh, the, let's start with this question again. Um, you have to put some assumption on the connection function, right? Make it too constant, you can get dense graph. Uh, yeah, so what I, what I really need, right, in order to not get dense graphs, right, is uh, uh, 
it, it, that really basically depends on how it depends on their distance, right? So for for example, right, if I if basically this uh, this kappa is independent of the distance, of course, yeah, then then I get dense graph. So indeed, there are some conditions on on kappa. They're they're actually quite quite lenient. We can actually get, uh, and I mean, I can include a slide with all of those things, right? But uh, there are some conditions, but they're quite lenient. Uh, but indeed, if you're not careful, then you get you get uh, dense graphs or nonsense things. Uh, Okay, so I want to talk a bit about these uh, local weak limits, and for that I need to, well, at least I thought I would have to at least talk a bit about local weak convergence. So here's my attempt of capturing local weak convergence in one slide. Uh, and then uh, if at the end of the slide uh, Remco uh, doesn't walk away, then I think I have done a reasonable job, right? So, okay. So the main question you can ask in general about any sequence of random graphs is, well, when does a sequence like this converge? And for dense, uh, dense graphs or almost dense graphs, there are very beautiful theories and, and frameworks for this. But we're interested in sparse graphs, and those are usually quite difficult. And local weak convergence tries to sort of capture this, this concept. So when does this sequence converge? So here's the idea. You have a sequence of graphs, say gn, gn plus one, right? They're slowly growing. And you want to understand, well, what does it mean for this sequence to grow to sort of some infinite graph? Now, it turns out if you want to do this, you shouldn't just look at an infinite graph, but you should look at an infinite graph together with a designated root that we call the uh, designated node we call the root. And then basically, what is the idea of local weak convergence? Well, if you take, if you take a, uh, a node sampled uniformly at random in, say, this graph, and you look at its local neighborhood, and you do the same in this graph and in this graph, then basically local weak convergence says that this is a limit of the sequence if the probability of observing a certain neighborhood around these uniformly randomly sampled points converges either in distribution or in probability to the probability of observing this neighborhood around the root. That is basically the idea behind local weak convergence. You can make this, for example, a bit more explicit by saying that, okay, what does it mean? You need that for every positive r and any finite rooted uh, graph that the, the fraction of nodes whose r neighborhood in the graph is isomorphic in the rooted graph sense to this graph, that this fraction converges in probability to the probability that the R neighborhood of the root is isomorphic. This is one way of uh, doing it. There are lots of, there are also other ways to, uh, to characterize this. Uh, so you can also characterize this in the sense that uh, for every bounded continuous uh, function H, basically its value uh, for around for a given, uh, uh, for a uniformly sampled uh, node, conditioned on the graph that that conditional expectation converges uh, to the same, but then for the, the infinite graph. The main takeaway from this is, and this is very important, that if you have local weak convergence, then you should be very happy because what it means is that any property of your graph that is local, right, will have a limit. Every property of your graph that only depends on, say, a finite neighborhood will have a limit in the, the infinite graph. And often you can explicitly write down what that limit is. Of course, it still depends on the exact graph and model you pick, but you can do this. So it's a very powerful tool. And the nice thing is that for the spatially homogeneous random graphs, we actually have this local weak convergence. And maybe you can already guess what the limit is. I might even have sort of given it away already. Uh, so again, this is a reminder of the model, right? So n points uniform with random in a n-volume d-dimensional torus, weights and connections according to this kappa. So then the result that uh, together with uh, Remco and Niladri we have is that under some mild conditions on this W and kappa, and they're actually quite mild, then you have local weak convergence of the sequence of random graphs. And where do they converge to? Well, they converge to a random graph that we can indeed see again as being now uh, positioned on just RD. And the root graph, uh, the root node is just the origin in RD. And the graph is constructed well, as you might expect. Well, what you do is instead of having endpoints uniformly at random, here you just take a Poulton version of a unit rate plus on point process where you have conditions on the root or the origin being in the point process. And then again, every point gets an IID copy of W and you just connect it again with kappa that the, the same kappa it depends on uh, the distance now in, uh, now in RD, not in the torus and the weights. We have a more general result where also this kappa here can depend on n, and then there's an additional type of condition about how fast this kappa, what kind of convergence this kappa n needs to have to kappa, but I didn't want to include it here. But basically, it is what you would expect. So you generated the graph on a torus of volume n, you basically stretch out the torus to infinity, you get rd, and then you just put the, the right plus one point process for the nodes, you get the limit. Might be easy to see, proving it is a, is a different thing, right? So you really need some 
some clever, clever things to actually get this proof to work. Where did the dependence of the x1 make sense? Uh, where the dependence? Uh, uh, all, all of these W's are independent. And the X's are also there uniform, right? So they're also independent, yeah. Now, another nice thing actually that, that we also were able to prove for these uh, versions of the models, which doesn't follow immediately from local reconvergence, is that also, uh, if you look at uh, the, the degree of a uniformly sampled node in your graph, then as a sequence of random variables, this is a uniformly integrable sequence. And that will actually help us. It will be very helpful. Um, so then, oh, yeah. Uh, well, G infinity is, of course, an infinite graph, so you would have to come up with some way to assemble, uh, say, a finite set of vertices from that. Um, so the first question is, do you have a way or not? Okay. Well, yes, yes, well, yes. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, this is a very dangerous question, because if, I don't, if I'm not careful, then I will, I will give a whole other lecture uh, uh, on, 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 on a way to basically... But there's a way. You can sort of look at this infinite graph, in, in a certain way, such that you can, uh, you can sort of extract finite size models from the infinite graph, meaning that if I would give you the infinite graph, then I'm also giving you a way to sample finite size models. The second part of the question would be these finite um, size no, versions of this graph. Yeah. Are, are they the same as the GN? Do we have like some consistency or do we get in, in, in the setting that I'm thinking of, which, which is slightly, slightly different from here, but very closely related, right? And we can talk to it offline. Most likely, yes. This is a project that I'm actually working on, so I would be very happy to discuss this afterwards. Uh, because if I would start now, then I will continue till the end of today. But uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you for the question. Yeah. I guess one of the difficulties that we're working on torus. Yeah. Because the boundary of the torus moves, it's difficult to prove this is a consistent graph equation. You do it with zero boundary conditions. No, yeah, well, yes, if you would do it with zero bound with no boundary condition, then it would be easy to think about. But if you then if you then Move this away from local reconvergence and talk and, 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 and think about another way, another version of convergence. Uh, then uh, you might be able to still deal with uh, boundary conditions on the torus. But uh, we can talk offline on this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So very, very, very quickly. Uh, so what can we now prove? Well, we can indeed prove that these graphs are sparse. Um, and actually, for this, we need this trick. We need to use this uh, uniform integrability because the degrees are definitely local, but they're not necessarily bounded. So it's not a bounded property. But you can always sort of split it, of course, in, uh, by picking some fixed k. You can split it in something that is bounded, right, by what you put. Then this converges by local reconvergence. And then this converges to zero in the end when taking k to infinity because of uniform integrability. And then this then converges to the average degree. In total, this converges to the average degree of the root. You can prove this. But this is where you basically need uniform integrability. Now, for power law degrees, you can also have, be very specific. So we can be very explicit about what the degree of the, the root is. Uh, so it's some uh, mixed boson with some mixture that depends on kappa and, uh, and uh, the weight. Just, just rotation so SIRG is one in which you have vertices, and vertices, uh, a weight function, and a connection function. Yes, and, posi yeah, and these positions, right? Yes. Yeah. So you can, you can, uh, you can you, we know what the distribution of the degree of the root is, and then we can indeed also prove that indeed the, the tail distribution uh, in, the, in, my, in my finite size random graphs converges to the tail distribution of this root. And again, depending on, uh, there, are, there are ways that you can pick your kappa and your w uh, to get regular varying functions here. Now finally, for clustering, again, clustering, this is, this is, this is a bounded and local property. So local reconvergence immediately gives you that this basically converges to the clustering coefficient of the root. Similarly, you can prove that this local clustering function converges to this expression, which is just, it's the, the clustering coefficient of the root conditioned on the root having the root k. So it's, but again, right, this is, this is very nice. Local reconvergence basically gives you all of this. And then because, of the, because these models uh, have this geometry, you can also prove that these things are indeed uh, strictly positive. All of them. All right. So what I want to talk to one uh, one uh, one last thing before I move on to the next. What I want to do is I want to talk a bit more about uh, basically about 
this last part, right? Because remember that one of the things, as I said, is ideally what we want is that this function is regularly varying as well. So I now know that the, the, the clustering function of my random graphs converges to some limit function. And now I can ask, well, when is this limit function regularly varying? So this is what we started in a different paper where we used sort of a slightly more specified model setting. So it's still in this family. We took our weights to be Pareto uh, uh, with a, a PDF exponent beta, strictly bigger than two. And our kappa is of this form. So the most important part is that we do is we take the, uh, the maximum of the two weights and we multiply it by the minimum, which we raise to some power A. And then we divide it by the, the distance to the power D. We, of course, have to take the, the maximum uh, of this and one because else it's not a probability. And we can also take this to a power alpha, where alpha can be inf infinite, meaning that at, when we take alpha infinite, it's just the indicator that this thing is, uh, is strictly bigger than one. This is how you interpret alpha to infinity, if alpha is infinity. But the main thing is that uh, we pick this, this, this product of the minimum uh, weights and the maximum weights. Now, and what we can then show is uh, that indeed, this, uh, we, can, we can basically uh, establish the scaling of this, limit, uh, of this limit function very explicitly. Uh, so in particular, we get that if we rescale this function by some function, uh, that we have explicitly, it converges to some constant. And of course, everything depends on all the parameters that we have. And now it's of course very important what this function is, right? Because if we, well, we would like it to be regularly varying and it turns out it is. So here is, uh, it, it has five different cases depending on the couple of parameters. Should we look at this, look at this picture. So this is a picture that uh, Niladi uh, generated. So basically what you see, there's this red regime or had this red regime. And in this red regime, basically, this function scales as k to the minus 1. At the boundary, this, this dark red boundary, you get an additional log correction factor. Then as you move into the, and when you move into the yellow regime, basically, the scaling is still an inverse power of k, but now the exponent actually depends on your model parameters. And then at the green boundary, this, you, you're only left with a, a logarithmic scaling. And then in the blue boundary, actually, this function is constant, meaning that this function is also constant, doesn't depend on k. And that's actually interesting um, because here, above this orange line here, your graphs are still sparse. So here we have sparse graphs, but the clustering coefficient, this clustering function is constant as k goes to infinity. So that means that no, no matter how large you pick your, your k, right? Your, your, your node is going to be sparse, will, but it will have many triangles. So even very large nodes, right, will have many triangles, but your graph is still sparse. So it's a very structured graph. Here, here we have very structured graphs. Below this line, the, the degrees are infinite or undefined. So, but this is very nice. Uh, so basically, we, we can prove that for basically in this broad uh, subfamily, we get uh, a clustering function that is regularly varying. We can actually completely characterize the scalings in the different regimes. And if you're interested, we also have explicit uh, expressions for this gamma, explicit meaning in terms of integrals of some functional that depends on your model choices. Uh, well, at some point, you also have to integrate out uh, over, the, over the positions. And then D plays a role in the sense that uh, 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 you, get, uh, you get, say, uh, in, inside this constant, you get uh, volumes of, uh, of the D-dimensional unit ball. So this is how D comes up. And it also comes up in that some of the integrals are uh, over D dimensional space. Uh, yeah. So when from this clustering function, you want to go back to the average local clustering, you only did that at the beginning, you said that you need to find the uh, clustering right? Yeah. Uh, Uh, well, you can, but you can also directly compute the clustering coefficient. Yeah, yeah, again, right, you have this, uh, if I go back, you have this very explicit expression, you can, you can just compute this. In terms of the phase diagram with all the colors, uh, does it mean that there's some region where the clustering is fine, like where you get this from? The average local clustering. The average local, oh, that's a good question. Oh, yeah. But it's, de it's definitely finite up to here. Uh, and then at the boundary, I don't know. And here, I'm also don't know. I don't think we looked at this. I'm now looking also. Well, you 
constant. Yeah. Yeah. So expect it to also be be uh, be constant here. Exactly. Yeah. So but but uh, this this is I don't know for sure. Okay. Let's say roughly you expect anywhere here to have a finite local clustering. Yes, a local cluster coefficient here should be finite and probably also here. But we we haven't looked at this exactly. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, it does not. But the why is? It turns out the dimension only comes in uh, uh, in the constant. Some intuition, some basic. Yeah. Yeah, so the D is not here, right? And then, so there, there might be, there might be different uh, kappas that you can pick such that your dimension will play a role. But for this, this, this family, say of kappas, it, uh, it does not. And indeed, they're they're sort of picked cleverly. So that also, for example, if you if you look at if you just integrate this out over the over the Ws, basically, uh, you just if you integrate this out, right, everything, then basically what you get because of this choice, you just get. Uh, you just get uh, sort of unit volume balls, can sort of extract them because of this this form. That's so why you always get the volume factor for the two. Yes, you always get the volume factor somewhere out, and then uh, and then the rest. Uh, yeah. So okay, so it's a clever. Yeah. So in retrospect, it's a clever way of we of, of of us picking it. Um, but it's I mean, if you just look at this, it's not completely obvious that it doesn't depend on them. Okay, uh, so I want to do one thing is that, uh, and basically, so what I did now is, uh, um, so let, okay, so let me now move to uh, another set of models within this family of models, which are uh, one dimensional, they're, they're called one dimensional uh, geometric and homogeneous random graphs. So basically in this set of models, right? I just pick D to be one, A to be one, right? So I just take the product of the weights uh, and I take alpha to be infinity. It just means that, and I add an additional constant here. That's not that important. So I get, basically I have this, pro this connection probability function. So just, you just look at if your distance less than this, uh, this product of the weights with this constant. If so, you put an edge. Uh, and again, your, uh, your Ws are power laws. Now, to show you the results, I'm going to do a slight uh, change of uh, notation. I'm going to write uh, beta as 2 eta. Doesn't really change anything. So basically, this is now the, the setting. It will give us slightly better expressions. Um, so what do I want to say? Well, first of all, what do we know, right? We know for these models. Th these models fall under spatial homogeneous random graphs. So we know that by local reconvergence, this property for every k converges to this. We also know for this function that this function we know what this asymptotic scaling is. But we don't, what we don't know from this is what is the asymptotic scaling of this thing. Because we only have pointwise convergence here, and here we have an asymptotic result. So together, they don't necessarily imply that this thing also has this scaling. Local reconversion doesn't give you this. But this is a relevant question to ask. And it turns out, so let me first indeed just slightly simplify this, uh, this expression using that a, a is one, uh, these types of things, I get basically this. So basically what we would like to show is that this thing also scales basically asymptotically as that. And that's not an, an immediately consequence of the, of the local reconvergence result. <coughs> However, for these models, we were able to prove that. And with we, uh, I mean, this is to work together with Nicolaus von Tulaken, Tobias Muller, also in the audience, and a uh, PhD student of him at that time, Marcus Schepers. So basically, what do we prove here? So here we have the local clustering function for the graph. We divide this by what its limit should be. And importantly, we consider a sequence of, uh, of case that also grows to infinity as n goes to infinity. And what we can then prove is that this fraction converges to one in probability. So what does it mean? That means that indeed, the scaling of this thing is the, asymptotically has the same scaling as this thing. That's something that we didn't get from local reconversions, but at least for these, for these models, we can prove it explicitly. Now, there's one condition. Uh, K can't, this, these sequences can't grow too fast. 
But with too fast, I mean that if they would grow strictly faster than this, than this rate, then a result like this can never be proven. So we're basically almost at the optimal range of what we can have our K grow, how fast K can grow. Okay. So to summarize this part before I very briefly go over the second part, but that's okay. Yeah. Now, I mean, if you take, I mean, you can also take KN to stop growing at some point, but then uh, the result already follows from local, uh, we converge because if K is fixed. Here we want K to constantly grow. We basically want to constantly sort of look, look further and further and further as our graphs grow and then show that the scaling is what we would expect it to be. K can always be fixed in the exact result that we have in the paper, then basically uh, uh, K just has to be, K is basically little of this and it can be fixed. It can stop at some point growing. Okay, so to summarize uh, this part, basically what I, I mentioned is that, uh, what I tried to explain is that we want, to, we want random graph models that mimic these properties of sparse power law degrees and clustering, and that by adding geometry, that actually helps us, and actually by mer you actually utilizing geometry, you can actually get models that have all of this. And actually the models that we have also have local reconversions, which make them very powerful, because you actually very easily get asymptotic expressions, and then you just have to analyze the asymptotic expressions. Now, the title of this conference also is Challenges in, uh, in Network. So I also have some challenges, right? There's always some challenges left. Um, so one is, of course, to also utilize, now we utilize the geometry to study clustering and degrees, but of course, it would also be interesting utilizing this geometry to study other structural features of graphs that is uh, often still open. Um, then. In Dealey, ideally, we would also like to be able, as I mentioned in the slide below, right? So if you want to also have this, this scaling at the finite size level, right? Then that doesn't immediately follow from local reconvergence. So it would be very nice if we can extend sort of uh, this local reconvergence to also basically give us these type of uh, finite size scalings as well. And finally, it would also be nice to develop a framework that doesn't only give us asymptotics for lo fixed local properties, but for what I would call almost local properties. So there's a very nice result by Remco where he proves that if you look at the size of the giant component uh, for graphs that have, uh, say, a local weak limit, then if you add, add one more condition on these models, and it's an if and only if condition, then you can prove that the fraction of nodes in the giant converge, converge to the probability that the root is in the infinite component. So it's basically saying that sort of yeah, the size of this, this, this giant component is sort of an almost local property. It's still reasonably captured well by this local reconvergence concept. And it would be nice to extend this to other properties as well, such as, for example, K cores or these types of things. All right, I have five minutes. Perfect. So I will skip through several slides here. I will try to give you the punchline here because I think this is also very nice. So I just spent a lot of time basically talking about how to use geometry to get nice models for random graphs. And now I want to go the other way around. You use geometry to get, a, to get a network. You only give me the network and you ask to me, ah, can, you say, can you tell me something about the geometry I used? So, and ideally, what do I want to be able to tell you? Well, I would like to tell you, for example, what is the curvature of your geometric space? And for those of you that are not a sort of a geometrist, for example, you can think of curvature as just a very, very simple general notion to indicate how different your space is from Euclidean space. So if your space has zero curvature, it's, it's Euclidean, then you have spaces of negative curvature, hyperbolic type of spaces, and the other regime is space of positive curvature, spherical spaces. Now, they're different if you uh, work in the field of Riemannian manifolds, there are different ways to characterize geometry. In this part, I'm going to focus on Ricci curvature. And this I do want to cover. I'm not going to give you the definition of Ricci curvature, it's in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a, of a uh, of a tensor on the manifold, all of these types of things that I don't want to do. What I want to give you is sort of an idea of what Ricci curvature tells you about moving balls. So what I mean with this, so I'm taking a point on my manifold, a vector in some direction, and then basically if I compute the Ricci curvature of this Ricci curvature constant of, the, of this vector, that is basically related to how much my volume, volumes of ball change when I move them along the direction of V. So what do I mean with this? If I, if I walk a certain direction, if I walk a certain distance delta in the direction of V and I enter the point Y, I then take a ball around X and now I'm going to transport this ball parallel 
to, uh, with respect to the vector v towards y. So I'm going to do parallel transpositable. And then several things can happen. First, if this Ricci curvature is zero, the volume of this ball is preserved. So the volume of the ball end up is the same. If Ricci curvature is negative, my volume will increase. So in hyperbolic spaces, volumes increase. And if my Ricci curve is positive, volumes shrink. And this is important because it tells us that without giving you a definition of Ricci curvature, it tells you that if you want to move away, right? Because if you want to say something about the curvature of your geometric space based only on your graph, you need some notion of curvature for your graph. And basically this intuition tells you that, okay, what would you need to do this? Well, you would need three things. You would need a notion of a distance. Well, okay, so it's a metric space, shortest paths, for example, right? You need some way to measure the volume of a ball. In this, here we're going to do this by using probability measures on our, on our graph, uh, on our nodes. And finally, you need to be able to compare ball volumes. And here we're going to do that using optimal transport distance. This is very abstract, but let me give you the definition of, uh, of, uh, of curvature that you can use on the graph. This was coined, uh, this, was come, uh, this was done by, Olivier, uh, by Jan Olivier in around 2006. It, uh, there's a nice paper from 2009. And it's a very general, it's for any metric space. So you have a metric space, and then at every point in your metric space, you have a probability measure on, uh, have a probability measure. And then you define the curvature between two points as this, is, uh, this expression where W1 is simply the Wasserstein metric of order one of these probability measures. Now, why does that make sense, right? Let me, uh, let's consider two points. So I'm going to take a uniform measure on, on point X, I'm taking a uniform measure on a ball of radius epsilon. And at point Y, I'm taking a uniform random measure on a ball of radius epsilon prime. Now, if epsilon and epsilon prime are the same, then you can show that this Wasserstein distance is just exactly the distance. So that means that this curvature is zero. So if the balls have the same volume, curvature is zero. If this ball, if this ball is larger, you can show that this curvature is negative. If the ball is smaller, the curvature is positive. So you evaluate the equation and hope it moves back. Hmm? You, you say you move a ball from one place to another, but this is the place, some special place, because otherwise you move it back. And then... No, no, so I, move, I do parallel transport, right? So, well, here I don't, right? So here I just compare uh, two uh, uniform measures on balls of different sizes, but in the, in the manifold setting, I do a parallel transport. So every point, right, in my ball is transported parallel with respect to the, the, to the vector that I took. And then depending on the metric, it can sort of deviate away from that trajectory, which means that I'm stretching out my ball or I'm compressing my ball. Yeah, because you do parallel transport again. So if you ping pong right, you will uh, things will explode. If you ping pong, things will explode. But then, uh, this is just uh, this is just a, a sort of an intuition to think about this Ricci curvature, right? So I mean, but this parallel transport is uh, 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 this is uh, this is a property of the geometry of the space. So basically, stretching out space and compressing space. But indeed. Oh, sorry, yeah, no, no, this is the notation I took from, uh, sorry, yeah, indeed, sorry, this is the notation I took from, from, Olive, from Olivier's paper, yeah. Yeah, no, it has nothing to do with my previous paper. Now, I will take two, uh, two more minutes. Um, this is a nice intuition. It at, at least tells you in some way that sort of this, this uh, larger, smaller balls, it somehow, uh, it somehow compares. But the, the best result is the following. So you can take a smooth, you can just, see what happens if you apply this notion to the Riemannian manifold setting. So you take a smooth, complete, n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, take two points at distance delta, take, take the uniform measure of a ball of radius epsilon on both points. And now Olivier proved, basically he gave an exact expression, asymptotic expression for his curvature in terms of the Ricci curvature and the parameters delta and epsilon. And in particular from this, it follows that if you rescale this Olivier Ricci curvature by a constant that depends on the dimension and the distance, and then you let both the distance decrease and you shrink the balls, then you recover the Ricci curvature. 
That makes sense. Curvature is a local property, so you need to look at smaller and smaller regions. But it also shows that at least in the continuous setting, this notion of curvature makes sense in a way that you can actually recover which curvature from it. Now, I will just briefly skip over this. So the question then immediately comes, okay, if you can do it in the, um, if you can do it in the continuous setting, then can you do the same in the discrete setting? So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to look at two points in our graph that are at a certain distance away from each other. We're going to put a metric space on the graph by putting weights on all the edges. So we're looking at our graph as an edge-weighted graph. And then the metric is just going to be the shortest weighted path distance. And then, for, uh, and then we also need to uh, say what the probability measures around each point are. So for that, we're going to take some, uh, some delta n. And at every point, we're going to look at the uniform measure on, on basically all nodes within distance delta n from the node. So you take a node to your graph, look at all other nodes whose shortest weighted path distance is less than delta, and you take just a uniform measure on those nodes. It's very similar to the setup for the, uh, for the continuous setting. And we, of course, have to study this in a certain model, right? We want to prove that we can recover curvature. So what we do is we basically do uh, random geometric graphs on a Riemannian manifold, compact. So you take a compact Riemannian manifold, you first have to put your, your, your reference node x here with a vector v. You put another node here at distance delta. And then you just put a uniform, uh, you put a point process on the manifold such that the expected number of points is n. And you just connect all points that are within, uh, within radius epsilon. So I first have to put two points there because that's where I want to compute curvature over. And then I just put a random geometric graph around it. Now the question is, right, if you give me this graph, can I recover the curvature of the manifold you use to construct it? And very shortly, the answer is yes. Depending on, you need some scaling, you need some scaling of the connection radius and the measure radius, but you can recover it. You can actually recover it in an L1 convergence. So quite strongly. Now, what I do want to say is that we can only prove this for non-sparse settings. We can make it almost sparse, meaning that we can tune the parameters such that the average degree scales only logarithmically. We can't do it for sparse graphs. Um, what I want to show before I end is I want to show you that actually we prove convergence, but our theoretical results can't really give you a reasonable rate of convergence. We can only get logarithmic rates. But this is a plot of simulations, large-scale simulations, that actually show you that this rate of convergence is actually quite fast. So here's the size of our graph. And here's for different, different types of manifolds. So we have a torus for uh, curvature 0, a sphere for curvature 1, and a Bolsa surface for curvature minus 1. Bolsa surface is a compact hyperbolic uh, manifold. And you can see that all of these, all of these region curvatures converge quite fast already for around, if your graph is 10 to the 4.5, actually your region curvature is already quite close to the actual curvature of the manifold. So these results are quite, uh, quite good. What is more surprising is that when we do the simulations for sparse graphs, meaning outside of the regime that we can actually prove, we also get convergence. So we can't prove that this holds for sparse graphs, but the simulation strongly suggests that it should be true. And, that's, and actually, this brings us uh, to one of the main challenges here is indeed that I had so very briefly, because I was a bit out of time, which was OK, we had some nice discussions, is what I want to basically, what the, the summary here is that there is a notion of curvature that you can define on your graph such that you can recover the curvature of the manifold you used to construct your graph. So you can extract geometric properties from your discrete structure in some asymptotic sense. We can only prove this for non-sparse graphs, but simulation seems to suggest that it holds for, uh, for sparse graphs as well. So one of the main challenges here is to actually prove this for sparse graphs. But for this, we really need new ideas. All of our ideas and our, our, the, the techniques that we use are completely useless in the sparse case. And in the end, of course, the general challenge in this sort of topical field, I would say, is that, well, geometry is a very powerful component in both uh, the, uh, in both creating random graphs, but also in studying their properties. 
But in general, we have sort of very little idea of what the actual impact is of adding geometry or models on the actual structure. I mean, yes, we can expect that clustering is increased and we do see this, but we really don't know what happens if, uh, if you, how, what the impact of geometry is on other structural properties of our graph at a general level. So this is what I would say is a general challenge in, this type of, uh, in these types of models. So with that, I come to the most important slide, which is where I thank all my, uh, all the, all my co-authors that helped uh, on all of these projects. So these are William Cunningham, Nicolaus von Tlakes, Remco from the Hofstadt, Dimitri Kriukov, Gabor Lipner, Nilading Maita, Tobias Muller, Marcus Schepers, and Carlos Stukenberger. This is a list of uh, the papers uh, that cover all of the things that I talked to today. So if you're interested in any of them, you can look them up here. And with that, being slightly over time, I do want to thank you for your patience, your attention, and I will be happy to take any short questions. We have time for a few questions. Uh, if I remember correctly, after uh, there was some work uh, characterizing Olivier Ricci curvature. Uh, in graph in terms of uh, an expansion over uh, loops of different sizes. So it was a combinatorial alternative uh, uh, characterization of it. You didn't touch upon this. Uh, yeah. But uh, perhaps uh, there's a way to study directly this expansion and all the terms uh, to, to control the asymptotics. So does this... Yeah, so I mean, I, I know that I, that result I, I have indeed seen. I. I have to refresh, it was a paper, I don't remember. Yeah, there might be something there. I mean, I have to, I, I, it's still on my list of things to look into more carefully, uh, but there could, there could be something there. So you're right, there could be something there uh, to, actually, to actually study the asymptotics more, more carefully. But I don't dare to say exactly how, whether or not you can actually do it with these techniques uh, and, and how much work it might be. Edge weights, I think I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, so. yeah. There are two ways you can choose this. This is, I, I skipped over this before uh, for time, but they're basically for our results. We have two versions of the results one is the cheating result, and in the cheating result, what we do is for every edge, we put as a weight the distance between the nodes on the manifold. So that's cheating. You're putting you're exactly you're putting geometric information in your graph. Okay, you can recover the curvature. Yay, congratulations, right. But we also have a result for the non-cheating case, uh, where basically the weights that we put is just the connection radius. And the idea behind this is that if your graphs are, uh, are, uh, are, not, uh, are, are reasonably dense, then if you look at nodes that are, are a bit further apart, then the actual distance in the manifold is very well approximated by just uh, epsilon times the shortest path distance. So this is a result that was proven for two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, a two-dimensional Euclidean uh, space. Uh, and we can then use this for our setting where we just look at two-dimensional manifolds because we're only interested in local properties. So we just look sort of uh, very locally, then approximated by uh, a Riemannian manifold, and then use this result that says that epsilon times the shortest path distance is a good approximation of the manifold distance. Yeah, but thanks for that question. So yes, that's, uh, I skipped off. Not that we'd like to come again.